task is serious, but I think bringing this group of people together, it's, it's really our, our, there's no limit to what we can achieve. One of the aspects that I believe anti-Semitism is about, why it's a complicated, complex issue, and there's multi-layers, there's economic reasons, political reasons, ideological reasons, um, psychological reasons, but I think ultimately an element of anti-Semitism of why people want to exterminate the Jew. I believe that in a sense, given the legacy of Judaism, as our colleague pointed out, which is really absent in many ways from the academy, that in a sense, anti-Semitism is not just about destroying the Jew, but perhaps by destroying the Jew, you can destroy God, or replace God. And given what our colleague said, that the, 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 the profound uh, missing element of our education, Jewish education in the academy, right? So not just Jewish scholars doing sociology or social, social science or philosophy, but Jewish thought and Jewish ideas and the fact that anti-Semitism perhaps is about trying to kill God. It's a great honor and privilege for me to be able to introduce to you one of my teachers, Rabbi Akiva Zweig. Akiva is the Rosh Yeshiva, the head of a yeshiva or the Talmudic College of Florida, and I've had the, the really profound honor to, you know, in a way, I think Bob Dylan says, uh, you know, we live in a world of lies, and fighting anti-Semitism is fighting in the world of lies. But for a few hours a week, I got to hang out with Rabbi Zweig and study Torah and Talmud and thoughts that are at a, a higher level. And it was a real, it's a privilege to do that. I'm really happy that Akiva Zweig, Rabbi Zweig, came all the way from Florida to be with us. He's going to be the opening address and he's going to speak about a biblical perspective on anti-Semitism and the evolution of humanity. So Rabbi Zweig. Steps are coming. Good evening, everyone. It's really an honor to be here. It's my third year attending ISGAP Summer Institute on Anti-Semitism at Oxford University. There's a lot of brain power in this room. There's a lot of emotion, a lot of thinking, and I'm hoping to share some meaningful ideas with you tonight. I just want to begin by mentioning that my grandparents lived here in England during the Second World War. They evacuated from London to the farmlands when the bombings were taking place. I'm sure that before I was born, they never imagined that I would be standing here tonight worrying again about the anti-Semitism that is growing across the globe, in Europe. Many Jews here in London are fearful for their lives, their futures here in England. And it is definitely scary times. At the same time, it is so exciting that we live in a world that we can engage together in a setting like this that allows us to share the fears, but also the hopes, the ideas that hopefully can help us all to innovate change. In Judaism, we have an important rabbinic custom to open any public address by giving respect and homage to the host and location of the event. Tonight, I acknowledge the importance and prestige of Oxford University, and specifically St. John's College, which is prominent 
under the Oxford umbrella. Many of us are aware of the illustrious history of the University of Oxford. This university started well over 900 years ago and is in fact the second oldest college in the world. It operates the oldest university museum and the largest university press in the world. The far-reaching impact of its graduates and students, of whom many are heads of state, is both significant and profound. A couple years ago I mentioned that I was fascinated to learn that the motto of the University of Oxford is Dominus Illuminatio Mea, or the Lord is my light. Certainly a credo, such as the Lord is my light, is not only a mantra but a vision as well as a mission statement. Interestingly, I believe that this motto is very relevant to our discussion tonight regarding anti-Semitism and its deepest origins. Perhaps because education is in my blood as well as my lifelong ambition, I am biased as to the importance and the role of education to humanity. My father, Rabbi Yochanan Zweig, founded a university in Miami Beach, Florida, and he is known throughout the world as a rabbinic Talmudic scholar and genius. It is not an exaggeration to rank my father as one of the great Jewish thinkers and Talmudists of the last several decades. The organization that has brought us all here tonight to explore this most important issue of anti-Semitism deserves our complete respect and attention. While the entire world is feeling the effects of terrorism, extremism, and abhorrent violence, almost no one is taking a proactive approach to this global devastation. ISGAP is being proactive in investigating the underpinnings of anti-Semitism at this most important forefront, that of academia. ISGAP is leading a charge on the education of anti-Semitism and understanding its devastating effects on humanity. Our dear and brilliant friend, Dr. Charles Small, is a man of modest disposition and incredible knowledge and perspective. Thank you, Dr. Small, and thank you all principals and members of ISGAP. And I think I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to Dr. Carlton Long for inviting me here tonight to share a traditional Jewish Orthodox viewpoint on both the definition and origins of anti-Semitism. May God bless, all, bless us all that our efforts here these weeks at Oxford University and St. John's College have a positive impact towards peaceful coexistence and harmonious relationships among all the countries and peoples of the world. To be very honest, I had no idea that Dr. Long was going to be mentioning me tonight, and I'm very touched by his remarks. This evening, I would like to share with you two fundamental ideas on anti-Semitism. So once again, two fundamental ideas. I might be repeating paragraphs occasionally. I didn't lose my place. I think sometimes some of these bear repetition, and I'm hoping everybody who will have questions will refer back to either these paragraphs or others. The first idea is an exposition on the root definition of anti-Semitism. In this offering, we will explain why anti-Semitism is so appealing, as well as why it is so exceedingly difficult to eradicate. At the end of this portion, we will do a question-answer session for a few minutes. We will then proceed to a second idea, which will be a significantly shorter presentation. The second idea is on the global proliferation of anti-Semitism. We are all keenly aware of the recent outbreak of the murdering of Jews in the United States in Poe, California, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. In this exploration of burgeoning anti-Semitism, we will look at a few statistics and estimates that point at some globally emerging frightful trends of thinking and behaviors among mankind. It is my contention that these 21st century conditions are creating an extremely volatile global environment. It is my hope that by understanding these emerging trends, we can bring into focus some major aspects of social norms that need attention and fixing. Idea number one, the core definition of anti-Semitism. If you look at the Oxford English Dictionary definition of Semite, you will find that a Semite is a member of any of the peoples who spoke or speak a Semitic language, including in particular Jews 
and Arabs. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary specifically mentions any of a number of peoples of southwestern Asia. These include Akkadians, Phoenicians, Hebrews, and Arabs. Incredibly, if you look in the same Oxford Dictionary at the definition of anti-Semitism, you will find that anti-Semitism refers specifically and only to hostility or discrimination against Jews as a religious, ethnic, or racial group to the exclusion of any other Semites. How do we explain this phenomenon? On the one hand, a Semite is any member of many different peoples, and on the other hand, being an anti-Semite is having a specifically anti-Jewish agenda. I would like to call everyone's attention to one etymological piece of information, also courtesy of the Oxford English Dictionary. The dictionary says that the origin of the word Semite is based on a biblical character who was a son of Noah. The man, this man, Noah, is famous for having survived a flood that covered the entire world on a boat or an ark that God instructed him to build. The Bible records that one of the three sons with whom Noah journeyed on the ark was named Shane. The basis of the word Semite is this son who was called Shane. Shane or Semite. So we now know that the word Semite derives from the Hebrew name Shane, who was a son of Noah. I would now like to share with you some classic biblical teachings and expositions in traditional Jewish Orthodox thinking. These pieces of information are based on the five books of Moses and have been in existence for over three millenniums. Firstly, the man named Shem, this son of Noah, is the ancestor of all the Semitic nations. These include what today are the Jews, the Islamic people, and quite possibly large numbers of Christians as well. Certainly, the thinking of all these Semitic peoples and their respective religions shared the powerful influence of the Abrahamic tradition, who was himself a descendant of Shem. The Bible actually records generation after generation from Noah to Shem to Abraham. According to all classic Jewish literature, this man, Shem, established the first known university. It was titled simply the Yeshiva of Shem, or the University of Shem. Further, it is recorded in ancient Jewish texts that some of the students who studied in this university included many peoples of the world, among them Abraham himself and several of his descendants. So what was taught and studied in this first ancient university? The answer is the universal laws of mankind and society. These laws were given by God directly to the first man, Adam, and later to Noah. These laws describe the basic parameters of a society that recognizes the one God as the creator of the universe and king of all mankind. In brief, these laws ban the worship of idols, promote morality, as well as the adjudication of civil laws and rights, including the prohibited acts of murder, stealing, and adultery. In Judaism, these laws are known simply <clears throat> as the Noahide laws the Noahide laws. These are called the Noahide laws because after the deluge, the flood, Noah and all his descendants were instructed by God as to their observance. So, in brief, these laws ban the worship of idols, promote morality, as well as the adjudication of civil laws and rights, including the prohibited acts of murder, stealing, and adultery. A centerpiece of these laws is the concept that all mankind is created in God's image. This means that there is a reflection of God that is innate to every human being and that every human being has godly value. It is because of this godliness that murder is abhorrent. It is this godliness that uniquely dignifies all humanity. What I wish to highlight about these laws of morality and adjudication is the following. According to Judaism and Jewish law and thinking, these laws are universal. Every single human being on the planet is subject to these same rules and ethics. Moreover, these are the only universal laws. 
This concept that these are the only rules cannot be overemphasized. This exclusivity necessarily means that the only requirement by God to live an authentic, God-ordained, and condoned existence is to abide by this set of rules. The significance of this uniquely Jewish teaching is that all human beings have these same regulations, and all human beings are subjects of this one God, and all human beings are in God's image. Again, the significance of this uniquely Jewish teaching is that all human beings have these same regulations, and all human beings are subjects of this one God, and all human beings are in God's image. Per force, all human beings must recognize each other's right of existence, and all must serve this same God. The genuine Jewish view of all humanity is that no human being has the right to thrust any rule or dictum on any other human being except for these laws. This means that the entirety of humanity should have global views of complete tolerance for each other and respect for each other, except in violation of these Noahide laws. Under this definition, it would be illegal to kill or discriminate against anyone for race, color, or culture. The only guidelines are these rules. I suggest to all of us sitting here that this man, Shame, the son of Noah, the original Semite, saw it as, as his mission to universally promulgate these teachings. Because this man, Shame, understood that the flooding of the world was due to man's pervasive corruption, he felt impassioned to prevent the decay of future societies. Shame therefore established this first university as a means of educating the entire world, specifically as to the existence of God and the application of these universal laws. Indeed, the word university itself is derived from the word universe. The Oxford English Dictionary says that the Latin root of university means the whole or society. This, of course, tells us that the role of university is to educate the whole society as to ways of thinking and paradigms. The result of all the above is that a Semite is a person who lives by and teaches these universal laws, ethics of morality, as well as a paradigm of monotheism. The Semite focuses on the godliness of every human being and the inherent respect due every person. Therefore, anti-Semite or anti-Semitism is anything that contradicts or attacks these teachings. Let's explain this on a practical level. A Semite worldview is one where all people reflect godliness, have a right to exist, have a right to have a relationship with God and a system whereby these rights are protected. Furthermore, the adherence to these universal laws and ethics is the basis of all societal behavior and will bring whatever present reward or long-term future existence that God will provide. Whether or not this current world lasts forever and whatever comes next, the whole of existence is meant for all people. According to this Semite, there is no special club or exclusivity that denies membership. The only requirement are these Noahide rules. This world is meant for every human, and any future existence or experience is meant for every human. To my knowledge, the only well-known and identifiable group that teaches this authentic Semitic view is the Jews. It is for this reason that anti-Semitism is defined as against the Jews. What I mean by this is that the primary objection to the Semite is that a Semite does not agree that a relationship with God is exclusive. A Semite does not think that the on only one race or only one type of person is superior, only one type of person has godliness and is supposed to control others or dominate the world. An anti-Semite does subscribe to the notion that only one type of person, race or religion, is superior. Only one type of person has godliness and therefore will have a relationship with God. An anti-Semite does think that one type of person or one race or one religion should, yes, dominate the world. 
Therefore, a root cause of anti-Semitism is resentment of the universal ideas of the protected rights of humanity espoused in Jewish educational thinking. As an aside, this is the fundamental reason that Jews do not seek to proselytize. There is no Jewish notion that Jews need to save other humans. This is simply because all humanity can and should have their own unique relationship with God under the umbrella of the universal Noahide laws. Jews do not proselytize because there is no need to save others with Judaism, and because Jews do not have a mission to impose Judaism on humanity. As we all know from thousands of years of history of wars and suffering and violence among humans, so much is caused by notions of exclusivity, salvation, and superiority. Whether we look back to wars of religious versus pagan, or religious versus religious, or wars of global conquests, or the world wars, we almost always find notions of imposing exclusivity on a relationship with God, or superiority of race, or simply global domination. I contend that all this is anti-Semitism. The Semite teaches respect for all men and their right to exist, and for each person to have their own unique relationship with God under the very broad umbrella of the Noahide principles. As we mentioned earlier, the word Semite derives from the name Shem, who was the son of Noah. Interestingly, this word Shem actually means name. In other words, this man Shem was named Name. In Orthodox Judaism, the common way to refer to God is Hashem, or the name. This translates to the name because this is seen as the most respectful of the informal ways to refer to God. I believe that the reason that this son of Noah was called Shem is because it was his mission to publicize the name of God. He established the first university whose purpose was to teach the universal Noahide laws and to educate the entire world as to the fact of God's existence and his name. One last fascinating fact about this man named Shem. Scripture tells us that Shem eventually became the king of Jerusalem and a minister to God. In light of our understanding, this is no mere coincidence. In Judaism, Jerusalem is the city of God's presence. Even today, people from all over the world travel to Jerusalem to connect with spirituality and holiness. It makes perfect sense that the man who sought to educate the universe as to God's existence and name would be the king of this city and the minister of God. In a nutshell, anti-Semitism is incredibly appealing as it caters to the human desire to feel superior to others. A Semite subscribes to the worldview that all of mankind deserves respect and the protection of the seven universal Noahide laws. That's the nutshell. Anti-Semitism is incredibly appealing as it caters to the human desire to feel superior to others. A Semite subscribes to the worldview that all of mankind deserves respect and the protection of the seven universal Noahide laws. I would like to take any questions before we proceed to the second idea. Any questions? All the way in the back. Your name is? Shegul, S-E-G-U-N. It means victory. And uh, I live in South Africa. I study at University of Pretoria. I've been a student of the Bible from my toddler years. And I love the angle that you came from. It's very, very interesting. It made my time worthwhile. But my question is, uh, in listening, uh, the Semites, the, the, the Semite groups, you alluded to Christians. Uh, is that a presupposition that Christianity is a tribe or a race? And should anyone then, uh, for example, in an English and becomes a Christian, are they opposing ideas? Uh, or, or, I mean, are they impossible, you know, is, is it an impossibility that somebody could be an English and a Christian, or an Igbo, a Yoruba, and a Christian, or a Jew and a Christian? Because 
Our traditional view is that Christianity is not a tribe. It embraces all tribes and all peoples. I would like clarification. Sure. So, so your, question your question is, is am I contending in associating Semites with Christianity that Christianity is in fact a tribe? That's your question? Or a race? Right, no, that's not what I meant. What I meant to say is that many Christians have origins back to descendants of Abraham, who was himself a Semite. Meaning, back if we look uh, a couple thousand years, we would find that many of the people who became Christians, as we have come to think of them historically, also came from that same line that the Jews and the Arabs came from. That's all I meant to say. I wasn't talking about what determines uh, the actual label of a Christian today? Question. Rabbi, um, how then do we reconcile our concept of Jews or the people with this very um, fascinating um, concept? So, so this, this is the, the, the question, question that, that we get. get. Uh, yeah. The question is that people are very familiar and like to always remind Jews that there is a concept of chosenness and very often the concept of Jews and being the chosen people is seen as a superior point of view, not the one that I'm expressing tonight, which is that Jews really see their role as helping everybody understand that no particular group has a chosenness. And the answer that I uh, presented a few years ago, I mentioned it to Dr. Long, the way we see chosenness, we see it as responsible. In other words, uh, as a good friend of mine likes to say, the Jews are chosen, chosen for what? Right? Chosen to be persecuted, chosen for what? And the answer is, is that we do think in Judaism that at Mount Sinai, God gave us the special role of being responsible to make sure that humanity understood these very important messages. And uh, it's kind of like a minister, a reverend, a rabbi, a person who takes responsibility for others, unfortunately, suffers the consequences when the responsibilities don't play out well, and hopefully gets the pleasure of when those things succeed properly. So, in other words, the Jewish view of the chosen people is chosen to help the rest of the world succeed under these principles. So, it's an extra responsibility. Question. Of both sides. Benefits? Benefits. benefits. Who, who benefits? And why is there perpetuation of this long term from shame to from Noah? Who, who, can you talk a little bit about how you see the, uh, the interaction which is both sides are benefits? Because conflict is not one side. Is there, can you please uh, just uh, invite any So, so what would be so continuing uh, in the in the conflict tends to fuel the fire but the but cause who causes it's not one side. So, so you're, you're saying, saying instead, instead of discussing the causes of anti Semitism, let's look at the benefits of both sides. Both sides. What 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 to, to what two sides are you referring? Oh it's the 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 who are Semites? Okay, okay. the, the Semites Semite. who are anti Semites. Okay. okay. And I don't think it's just one uh, either or. Okay. okay. So, so looking at this, can we, right. can we come to a dialogue whereby we can uh, develop an understanding of what keeps the field? Is, is it not just comfort, not just apology, but there's some people who benefit from it. From
from... Okay, we're actually going to talk about the benefits and why people are attracted to anti-Semitism in this second idea. But just for a moment, the benefits of being a Semite, other than what we would classify typically as world peace, uh, is being able to learn from the creativity of every human being and being able to have human humanity benefit from those ideas. Are there any other pressing questions? Yes. Sure. So the question that you're asking is, how do we make relevance of the seven Noahide laws to people who don't necessarily subscribe to a god? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Again, we're going to talk about it in a moment where I think you're going to, you're going to see some more of the fleshing out of that. But specifically, <clears throat> the notions of moral versus immoral, good versus evil, truth versus false, those are all universal concepts. Now, why does a person subscribe to those views? Okay, I would contend God would make sense. Other people might have other reasons. But certainly those notions of right versus wrong, truth versus false, good versus evil, all of those things are a basis of understanding principles in the Noahide laws. Okay, that's sort of the, the way the conversation begins. We'll discuss it in the next, in the next segment, okay? Should we move on? And, okay, yes, one more question. What about idol worshippers? What, what about, about idol worshippers, worshippers in terms of? Say India. What, what about, about what's, what's, the what's the question? question? Well, so they're not part of this. Uh, Are they not part of this, this view? Right, so we, well, let's talk about idol worshipping, say, in India right at the end, okay? Because I just don't want to get sidetracked on that, but I'm happy to, happy to talk about that also. It's certainly an important question. Yes, we have a few more. Charles, you'll have to forgive me. I need a few more minutes. Yes. I'm not sure I understand your question. Can anybody explain to me that question? I'm not sure I got it. What is Okay, good. So what is, why are people driven to anti-Semitism? So I'm going to ask you a question in a moment. And I'm going to just ask you for a very brief, quick response. You'll see what I'm saying. So the question is, where do we go from here? As we mentioned before, anti-Semitism is appealing because it supports notions of superiority, domination. How can we address these underpinnings of anti-Semitism and hatred? How can we help humanity shift towards the Semitic notions of non-exclusive relationships with God? So the idea, number two, 
is this global proliferation that you're wondering about of why anti-Semitism. The 21st century represents a unique opportunity and necessity to view and understand humanity from a global perspective. Thanks to various innovations of technology and communications, mankind is capable of learning about human conditions and experiences across the globe in a matter of seconds. In addition, global information is available to be analyzed. I would like to share with you a fascinating statistic I recently learned, and it's just a question. And the question is, what percentage of all people on Earth are suffering from a mental health disorder such as anxiety or depression or have a substance abuse problem? In other words, out of the close to seven billion people in the world, how many of us are dealing with our own significant mental health or substance abuse issues? Everybody understand the question? Out of these seven billion people, about how many are suffering from these problems? Raise your hand if you think it's above 50 percent. Wow. Raise your hand if you think it's below 30 percent. Wow. This has been my experience. I was amazed to learn that the number is close to one billion people, or around 15 percent of global population. This online study, which is produced by Oxford Press, cautions that the real number is likely to be higher, because when it comes to mental health disorders and substance abuse problems, there tends to be significant under-reporting. To me, it is frightening to think that at a minimum, one out of seven doctors, one out of seven airplane pilots, one out of seven therapists, one out of seven policemen, one out of seven soldiers, one out of seven policy makers, et cetera, et cetera, are suffering from mental health or substance abuse problems. It's hard for me to believe that these types of issues don't negatively impact thinking and important decision-making abilities. Incredibly, as this room just demonstrated, practically every person I've asked these above questions seriously thinks that the number is much higher than 15 percent. That's amazing and not good. Most people guess 25 percent or higher. Of course, that would mean one or more out of every four people. So my contention, based on all this, is that we need to truly understand what is causing these serious life-impairing issues. Why is so much of humanity suffering from such illness? My answer is as follows. Underneath the human desire to feel superior is it, or entitled is a fundamental lack of fulfillment and lack of meaning and purpose. When as human beings we cannot ac access feelings of purpose and fulfillment, we feel an, un an emptiness and unhappiness. To compensate for that profound lack of feeling, we look to either escape those feelings or to fill that void. Therefore, so many of us escape through substance abuse or we develop significant mental health disorders like anxiety, depression. Another method of dealing with these profound feelings of, un of uselessness and unhappiness is by telling ourselves that we are inherently better and more entitled than others. These feelings of superiority allow us, al allow us to fool ourselves into feeling better. It is this need to feel better about ourselves that leads to the need to feel superior and ultimately to the hatred of others. Tragically, this leads to anti-Semitism and all forms of racism and virulent hatreds. The Semite tends to be the most reviled because the Semite proactively teaches respect for all peoples and advocates protection for the universal rights of humanity. Whether or not the number is 15 percent or more, it is clear that human beings are internally suffering. Whether or not the numbers have been or are increasing, we are all facing a global problem. I suggest that humanity is largely suffering from a sociological and philosophical shift away from values and meaning and purpose. Instead, over the last 150 years, humanity has been embracing physics and the sciences as an end unto itself. Instead of mankind seeking to do good and find meaningful avenues of fulfillment, we hyper-focus on improving our physical conditions and pleasures. Of course, a huge part of this is our assertion that if we really want something, we're entitled to it. It has become increasingly unpopular to use the lenses of good versus evil, moral versus immoral, truth versus false, and right versus wrong. Of course, using these lenses would impede our natural desire to be superior or entitled. The question is, where do we go from here? Sure, everyone has rights, but are these rights entitlements? Are they superiorities? If anti-Semitism and hatred arises from a lack of purpose and meaning in people's lives, then religions or worldviews that truly respect others are an antidote to hatred. A religion or worldview that sees the inherent value of godliness of every person is the antidote. 
The clearest worldview that promotes the universal rights of mankind along with using the lenses of right versus wrong is the Semite. As I stated at the beginning, the motto of the University of Oxford is Dominus Illuminatio Mea, or the Lord is my light. This motto is a shining example of an authentic Semitic teaching. By stating that there is a God and by recognizing that God gives guidance and that the lenses of good versus evil, truth versus false, and moral versus immoral are relevant, the University of Oxford has shaped itself in true Semitic fashion. Not only is the university teaching something Semitic, but it is in a university, which is the Semite tradition. It is no wonder that this university has succeeded so well for nearly a thousand years. Surely God is blessing this university and helping achieve its global impact. May God, or as we say in Judaism, may Hashem bless us all to recognize and observe these universal Noahide laws and learn to respect the godliness in every human being. In this way, we will certainly find purpose and meaning in our lives. With God's help, mankind will thereby experience tolerance, peace, and harmony for humanity and spiritual uplifting and fulfillment in a relationship with his great name. I'm out of time. Sorry.